So thank you everyone for coming tonight. My name is Lissa Weinman. I'm a partner here at 118 Elliott. <laughs> wow. I didn't even have to write a book and I got some applause. Thank you so much. Um, we've been doing this climate emergency book series with everyone's books. And um, we're going to take a hiatus over the summer and then come back with a set of authors in the fall. Um, but we've been really excited about having Chuck Collins here. Um, what can we say? You know, he's our, he, I always call him our local hero. He walks the walk. He's, um, he's been incredibly gratifying for me to know him uh, as a person. And I'm just going to give you a little uh, background. Uh, most of you probably know Chuck, but for those of you who don't, I'm just going to run through a little bit about um, the things that he's done. And it will just scratch the surface, of course. But um, so uh, Chuck started with community organizing. Um, he worked for the Institute for Community Economies in Greenfield from 1983 to 1981. Um, he founded United for a Fair Economy in 1995. And in the course of doing that community work in this area where uh, Alter to an Erupting Sun takes place, um, he helped, I don't know how many people who owned mobile homes uh, organize to buy and own the land under their uh, mobile home. And that, and that has been a real success. And Chuck was among the first um, to, to do that, to, to work with people so that they wouldn't lose their homes. Um, so he's been doing this kind of grassroots community organizing work really since the beginning, even before he got his degree from Hampshire College in 1984. Um, he has a master's in community economic development. Uh, he uh, is at currently at the Institute for Policy Studies, running the program on inequality and the common good. He also um, directs inequality.org, which is a, a website that is amazing. If you haven't looked at it, you should, um, because uh, there's all kinds of information, um, real, real data on, on inequality. The most recent uh, report was on the wealthy's private jets and how many people are using private planes and how it's diminishing air service for the rest of us. Um, so it, it, there's just up to the minute kinds of research and statistics that um, are used by policy change makers um, like Chuck, and he produces that that information through inequality.org and uh, the Pandora Project, which some of you might know, which looks at the mechanisms of how the wealthy hide wealth uh, globally. And um, you know, this is just the kind of stuff that we need in order to try to push for change. And he remains optimistic about the possibilities for change. And, and God bless you for that, Chuck. Um, <laughs> He's on the board of the Wyndham Windsor Housing Trust, and he's been affiliated with that organization for a very long time, even before it was called that. Um, he founded um, in 2008 Wealth for the Common Good, which in 2015 became the group called Patriotic Millionaires. Um, he's on the board of the po Post Carbon Institute, the Blue Mountain Center in the Adirondacks in New York. And um, what, what can we say? He's um, an incredible person. He's written many books on inequality, including Robin Hood Was Right and Born on Third Base, which was his first book, which is a bestseller. Um, there's a great interview with him on Fresh Air that you can listen to. And we've also, um, for the Brattleboro Words Trail, there's some beautiful audio where he talks about his work. And you can listen to that there, too, on the Brattleboro Words Trail and the Brattleboro Words Trail podcast. And I'm going to introduce um, Nancy um, Browse from Everyone's Books. And she's going to introduce Chuck because she's known him forever. <laughs> Thank you. Since you heard all of the publishable words about Chuck, I just want to say he's a heck of a good friend. And I really, excuse me, he lived in Green, Greenfield area, then moved to Jamaica Plain for a number of years. And we are so lucky in the Brattleboro area to have Chuck in Guilford now and hopefully for the long haul. We're, it's really a lovely and amazing. They've 
really just the minute they came, Chuck and Mary have just absolutely become part of the community and, and become amazing contributors to what we need to survive, which is a strong community <laughs> in this crisis time. So I am so grateful for having people that really seem to have their finger on how to create strong community because, like I said, we really need that right now. So thank you, Chuck. We thank love you. you, and you're the best. Listen, I think you might have taken my book with all my notes in it. It's one of those standing naked moments, you know, like. Sorry, Chuck. No, that's good. Thank you. Well, I, I mean, uh, I'm just so honored you came out. Um, this is like the hometown event, and, and many of you are kind of directly or indirectly woven into this story, but I definitely want to thank Lissa and John for creating this amazing space here at 118 and the art and everything that happens here. And Nancy, who I've known since we were teenagers, really, uh, you know, who, uh, when she was in Rhode Island, uh, apprenticing running a bookstore, which now we know that everyone's books has been, what, 38, 30, 39 years, right? So I knew her when she was apprenticing to own a bookstore. So that's... And, and Nancy's not, you know, bless the booksellers, right? The people who keep their bookstores and, and, as enterprises. But she, in this book, she's not just a, a, a owner of a bookstore. She, she and Bert were like among the earliest readers. You know, Annie Lamott has this, um, I think it's a useful concept, which is your shitty first draft, you know, that we, you know. Well, they read it, and they <laughs> gave me really valuable insight as the whole people that they are. And, uh, and, and there's a number of those readers that uh, helped me along the way. So uh, a few other gratitudes. Um, is Casey Williams here? Casey Williams is a good friend who lives in Greenfield who made the maps in the book. There are two really beautiful maps that are tailored to the story. And uh, you, when you look through it, you'll see them. Um, so and, and somebody said to me, you know, if there's a map in the book, it, doubles the chances I'm going to buy that book. And I'm like, well, <laughs> ah, there you go. Got to gotta, gotta have a map, you know, like how many of you look at The Hobbit, you know, and just look at Mordor for hours, right? You know, so. Um, and then uh, the folks from Green Rider Press, there's a great team there. Dee Dee Cummings, Sends Her Regrets. She is reading poetry in Norwich, Vermont tonight. And uh, so we, we gave her a pass. But uh, uh, editor Michael Fleming is here. Um, where are you, Michael? Michael is like a real writer. Uh, he is like a poet and a writer. If you don't know his poetry, you should check it out. And he's editor extraordinaire. And uh, really, really helped hone this book along with uh, Rose Alexandra Leach, who's another part of the Green Writers Press team. So thanks to them. Um, Robin MacArthur, probably not here. She doesn't even know the debt that I have to her as an author of place-based fiction in this area, telling stories and kind of giving me permission to kind of mess around with time frame a little bit. I really, really uh, inspired by her fiction writing. Um, and then there's some other people actually, here, fortunately here in the room, Melanie Kahn uh, and, and Star Latronica, our, our wonderful librarian. These are people that I sort of like talked to along the way, encouraged me and, uh, and, 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 and others. Actually, uh, uh, Lissa mentioned the Windsor, Windham Windsor Housing Trust. Connie Snow is here, who again, we've known each other since we were teenagers, um, who was the first director at the Brattleboro Area Community Land Trust when I knew her and has done amazing work in this community with some of us here. And then of course my spouse, Mary, who is really the, uh, you know, and some people read this book and know her and, know, and read the book and think, well, is this, about her, and just to be public, it's not. But there's a lot of Mary throughout the whole story. So, and to all the people who are here that have sort of helped shape it, the Springs Farm Gang, and you know our neighbors and others. So, thank you for coming out. And um, you know, this is this was actually the third book in a series that uh, 118 and Everyone's Books produced on climate change and. 
some of you, I'm just curious how many here people saw Andrew Boyd talk about, I want a better catastrophe. Okay, so this is the bookends, if you will, to, to that. Um, he uh, sends his regards, and um, he really loved the time he had here in Brattleboro. Um, so let me, um, I'm going to just talk and do a little reading. And, I, and, and you know, um, this, is, this is the first time I wrote a novel, so I've never done a novel reading. I've always written nonfiction books, which um, you'd, I think would be tedious to read in a public setting. Uh, I usually just sort of talk about the book, but I'm actually going to actually try to read a few little passages because it is a novel. And uh, the big, the, one of the big awesome benefits of writing a novel is no footnotes. Uh, you know, just uh, now, uh, not to say that I didn't do a lot of research, but uh, I didn't have to like verify everything in the ways at the very end where you're like, where is the footnote source for that fact that I made up, you know? Uh, so, but let me, I think, um, you know, the first thing I'll say is, you know, well, what is this book about? Which is kind of the hardest question, but, um, you know, I'm a, I'm, as, as Alyssa said, I'm a campaigner, I'm an organizer. I don't, I, I don't never set out to write fiction, um, but I uh, just had this story that I wanted to tell. It was sort of knocking on my inner door. Uh, I had a character, a composite of characters, and uh, it, it flowed out, and that's all I can say. It, was, it, 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 it wasn't one of these multi-year things. In fact, uh, with Michael Fleming's good counsel, it probably should have been a multi-year project, but I just said, well, Michael, I'm a, I'm a man in a hurry. Uh, you know, like my friend, like uh, many of you who are looking at the current moment we're in, the ecological and other crises that we're living through, uh, can I write a book that might be useful or crack open a discussion or uh, inspire, inform us in this moment? So, um, so that was my goal was to, you know, tell a good story, but tell a story that sort of is about how do we face this moment we're in. Uh, and part of it is future fiction, meaning it's really about the next seven years that we're in. Now, why the next seven years? Well, as, as you know, this is the critical decade. Actually, I just read an article today just saying if the major fossil fuel suppliers basically uh, continue business as usual, three and a half years from now, we will blow past the one and a half degree centigrade kind of carbon budget safety line that, that uh, the UN and others have advised us on. So the next seven years are critical. And in my hope was writing a story that showed not the zombie apocalypse or not, you know, Blade Runner, but what would it look like if one community started to turn the corner um, in the next seven years? What would that look like? So, and, and in the spirit of, uh, you know, Ursula Le Guin and Kim Stanley Robinson and the Ministry of the Future and others, you know, I was trying to like tell a story about the shift that we need to go through. So, um, so that, that's, that's a little bit of my motivation, although there's a bunch of other things for instance, uh, the theme of altars is big in this book, uh, Altar to an Erupting Sun, and I'll read a little bit about that, but I thought I would bring an altar. And uh, here, I'll flip on one of our battery-powered lights here, fire, fireproof, uh, fire safety right here. Um, but on this altar are some very, are people who are in the book. So there's a, there are real people in this story because part of it looks forward, but part of it also looks back at the people and the social movements that are on the altar of my main characters in this book and happen to also be a lot of them on my altar. Um, so that's, that's a, and, and, and one other just thing before I kind of, well, let me let me let me say a little bit about um, the book, and it's not a spoiler alert to 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 mention that the first chapter of the book is Ray Kelleher, who's my main character, who is really the the 
it's really her story, her formation that this book is about and all the people and forces and books that shape her. Um, so she's at the end of her life and she is terminally ill and she's uh, almost uh, in her early 70s. She's facing down the end of her own life and she decides to go out in a horrific suicide murder, taking the life of the CEO of an oil company who she believes is responsible for delaying our society's, our planet's response to the crisis. That's how, and I'm not gonna read that chapter. I'm just, that's, it's there, it's on the table. But then the question becomes, what impact does that have? And so the book explores, looking forward, what happens, what's the blowback, the considerable blowback to this action the repression, the um, the uh, fossil, the, the 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 clamping down on dissent, but it also looks at some things that crack open as a result of that, or maybe as part of the ripple effect of her action. So, um, so in that sense, it's a formation story. But I, I want to um, introduce you to Ray just a little bit through a few little snippets, mostly other people talking about her. Uh, a lot of the book is obviously her first person narrative. Um, so she's married to a guy named Reggie, Reggie, Reggie Donahue, who grew up in Dorchester, Massachusetts, totally, you know, kind of came out of a labor family. His dad, dad was an iron worker in the Quincy shipyard. Um, and he would, he describes himself as kind of a late in life back to the lander, meaning uh, late in his life, he discovered the virtue of trees and things like that. Um, but at that point, seven years after the act, the members of her community gather to have a, a birthday reflection on her life and legacy. And so he's thinking about what to say. He says, what can I say today about Ray that he hasn't already said before? Each year that goes by validates everything she predicted. She was prescient, a channeler, a manifester. She could see things that other people didn't see. She said, I had that power too, if I wanted to tap into it. You see, Reggie knew he was gonna lose her either way, either to the cancer that had metastasized throughout her body or her decision to go out with a violent bang. She could have lended, ended her life here at Hidden River Farm, which is where they live, surrounded by loved ones. People could have sung songs to her as she had done with so many others who had passed before. She could have gone gently to the other side, but no, not Ray. She was fueled by love, music, dancing, and rage. An anger so slow burn that it was chilling. Cold anger as Ray's old organizing, as Reggie's old organizing buddy, Ernesto Cortez said, cold anger is what you look for in a leader. The hot anger types, they flame out. They act impulsively. They turn off allies. The cold anger types can strategize, build alliances, think long term and persist. It was Ray who convened the hospice and green burial ministry here at the Hidden River Farm. Many days he listened to her talk energetically about conscious dying, not letting the medical industry and the funeral profiteers get their talons into you. We need to speak about death, face it, accept it as part of the great cycle. She loved to point out the various death practices from indigenous and other cultures from around the world. We have so much to learn from these traditions. Ray thinks about how every March, Ray enlisted him, did I say, Reggie thinks about, Reggie thinks about how every March, Ray enlisted him to join the salamander crossing teams that gathered along the roadways after the first warm spring rain. Any of you been part of the salamander crossing guards? Okay, very well, good, very good. Not surprised you're here. <laughs> Wearing reflective vests and holding flashlights, they make sure they made sure that the frogs and salamanders eager to attend wire, wild spawning orgies in the vernal pools 
made it across the road alive. Salamander protection required staying up till 11 p.m. <laughs> Several hours past Quaker midnight in Reggie's book. But nothing could deflate Ray more than holding a squished wood frog in her hand, knowing she could have saved a life. So happily, he joined the crossing guards. Save a life, take a life. Ray's reverence for life was consistent until her final minutes. So that's a little taste of Ray, a little window into Ray, and a few other just Ray moments. Reggie considers Ray a, a sort of Emma Goldman. I can't dance. If I can't dance, I don't want to be in your revolution, but with silly hats. He recalls, oh, Reggie appreciates that Ray intuitively understood the power of celebration. He described her to friends as a party in a box, just add music. She was the great fiesta planner, the celebrator of birthdays, the enchantress of dance parties, often arriving with an outlandish costume and mask. She was the shameless adopter of all fertility, harvest, and moon rituals. Any special day was an excuse for a dance and a celebration. St. Bridget's, Imbolc, Beltian, Lugnasa, Samhain, Fourth of Day of the Dead, Solstice, Equinox, New Moon, Full Moon, Juneteenth, Fourth of July, Halloween, Mother's Day. <laughs> and Oh, and another thing about Ray, that Reg, this is again Reggie, kind of just observing, is that Ray is a binge learner. She just gets obsessed with something, you know, pollinators. And she just like watches every documentary and reads these books, you know, and, and uh, you know, if she, li if she lived in Brattleboro her whole life, she would be like knocking down Star Electronica's door. She'd have a direct deposit program at, uh, you know, everyone's books. I mean, she would just be so, Reggie notices that Rare has, Ray has a pro proclivity toward binge learning. He finds this both endearing and maddening, as living with anyone with the periodic obsessions might be. She gets fixated on a topic and plunges in, reading articles, talking to people, devouring books, watching documentaries. Most amusing, she adopts characters, ways of speaking, and a dramatic flair for whatever she's immersed in. And the, he gives the example that Ray's lifelong interest in Emma Goldman is revived when she reads a book about Goldman's relationship with Alexander Berkman, the former an anarchist called Sasha by his friends. Berkman spent 14 years in prison for his failed attempt to assassinate the Pittsburgh industrialist Henry Clay, Flick, Henry Clay Frick. Ray is intrigued by their relationship and jokes with Reggie that they are Emma and Sasha. If Reggie is angry at someone, she says in a bad imitation of a Russian accent, Sasha, don't be upset. Don't go trying to shoot him. Or Sasha, what are you plotting now? So that's a little bit about Ray, who, who is really the, the, the heart and soul. Um, but in addition to Ray on the altar, uh, and I can just say this here, Wyndham County and Vermont is on this altar. And the reason that, uh, one of the things I, one of the motivations in writing this book was to show what does it look like to build resilient culture in the, in the, in the critical decade ahead. And there are all kinds of seeds and many people in this room are holding and nurturing those seeds. So just to, just to like bullet point a few that I, I see and I'm curious to hear what you see, Food system innovation, regenerative agriculture, living in harmony with nature, welcoming newcomers, welcoming refugees, climate refugees, resilient design. I think of Alex Wilson, resilience hubs. Uh, I, th I think of Anna Klein and the Regenerative Design Institute. The Rich Earth Institute. I mean, nutrient recapturing. Anybody been to see their new offices, headquarters? out by on Ferry Road, talk about a laboratory of innovation. You almost think like people thought Silicon Valley was a center of innovation, you know, maybe still think it is, 
I don't think so. But I think the Rich Earth Institute is the Silicon Valley, that this area is a laboratory for regenerative and resilient living. The land back racial equity work, the vibrant local culture, the poetry, the music, the, the bandwagon, dances, and the events, the celebration carnival culture. Where else do you go to like cranky shows? You know, like where else in America can you just like, there's a cranky show, which is like reminds us how people entertained one another before television, before the technologies. Uh, social housing, the Wyndham Windsor Housing Trust, huge chunks of the housing protected from the speculative market. That's my reminder that, you know, just keep track of time. Um, conscious dying. Michael Meyer here from Manitou, Higher Ground, is depicted in this book. I, these are things that are woven into the story, the threads that I want people to, around the rest of the country to know about, this laboratory that we've created here. Um, so imagine the work that all of these people are doing here in Wyndham County and what could possibly play out over the next seven years. That's what I try to fictionalize. So I mentioned altars, and I'm just going to talk about altars. I am going to talk a little bit about nonviolence and violence, but let me talk about sort of the altar and the death and dying work that I think is so. Um, and, you know, I, I think um, what I like to ask people is like, who is on your altar? You know, I have here a book that honors certain people. There's Mel King, who was my friend who ran for mayor of Boston. I worked on his campaign in 1983. He just passed to the other side. Um, in the book, there's a discussion about Ray working in a refugee camp. And if you read the book, she's working at this refugee camp in El Salvador, and she's getting oriented. And uh, this woman, uh, Ruthie Gaynor, says, uh, well, we really look forward to Egg Day. And Ray's like, Egg day? She says, yeah, it's the day uh, when everybody gets an egg. And Ray's like, one egg? She says, yeah, one egg. Well, wh well there are 4,000 people who live here. And uh, Ray gets the picture. So I have on this altar a picture I took in 1986 of egg day <laughs> in the Batania refugee camp. Just because like Ray, this made an impact on me. And even though I haven't been back to El Salvador in a while, I still think about Egg Day. Um, so what's on our altars? And what movements, because it's not just people, it's social movements that form us and shape us. Um, and uh, I, I think I was reading a, uh, a, a book by Graham Greene, who wrote you know, the power and the glory and the quiet American great British novelist. Um, and he, uh, he was hanging out with Omar Torrio, the president of Panama. And uh, he has these, uh, a book called Conversations with the General, a, non, a nonfiction book. But this one scene I remember, he, he's traveling, he travels with Torrio around Panama and he goes to different villages. And Torrio says, you can tell the healthy villages, they're the ones that take care of the cemeteries. And uh, his quote was, if people don't look after the dead, they won't look after the living. And, uh, you know, as you know from Day of the Dead or maybe watching Coco with your kids and grandchildren, the whole idea is in the Latin American tradition, but it's truly a global tradition global notion that memory is what sustains us. And as long as someone is in memory, they are with us. And that presente. And, um, you know, actually, I'm glad you said that because I had this little call and response that I was going to do later. But OK, so Mel King, presente, right? Ward Ogden, presente. Jonas Frick, presente, right? We have, we have a way to celebrate and mark. And uh, um, so Ray, my character Ray, is totally a sponge for this. 
she thinks what's warped about sort of Anglo culture is our and uh, is our attitudes about death and dying, and that if we could kind of figure out how to face that, engage with that, we would be better equipped to face the next seven years, ten years, the future. Um, so she is really a death with dignity activist. She would be probably hanging out with Michael Meyer and doing the higher ground. But at the farm where they live in, in, in uh, they create a memorial grove, very similar to this higher ground. And now we can't actually do that at our farm in, in Guilford because it's too wet. But um, anyway, so her, her, her community, this community that Ray's kind of brought together, forms not just a memorial grove, but a whole kind of ministry around death and dying. And I want to give you just a little flavor for that. Um, the sacred grove and memorial area at the farm are home to over 200 human remains. No concrete crypts, no carbon burst cremations, nothing that can't break down easily. Wrap me in a wine stained tablecloth and lay me down three feet in the soil, as Ray would say. Make me one with the compost, fertilizer for the trees. So that's Ray describing that. Um, and and uh, they, they, there's a whole group of um, folks who uh, form this kind of organization. And one of them, uh, a, a young woman, Rachel, who lives at the community, is uh, pretty much based on Mary Fraser from Dummerston. Is Mary Fraser here? Anyway, so Mary Fraser is the weaver of the willow coffins. So there's a character that uh, emulates her. So they have a practice. They create a little ministry called passing celebrations because it's, they realize people want to, uh, so I'll, I'll just read a little bit about that. Ray has sort of an adopted daughter at, at later in the story named Alex, Alex with an I. Alex and Ray meet with an older woman named Vera, who lives alone in a mobile home on a dirt road in nearby Halifax, on land next to her youngest son. They visit her every couple days and delight in her stories of growing up on a farm in Guilford and walking to one of the 14 one-room schoolhouses in the town. Vera tells them that she is a Bigelow, one of the old Guilford families. She met her husband at the Valentine Social at Broadbrook Grange Hall 151. She insists on including that number. Her mother-in-law was active in the lady sewing circle of the Universalist Society, which owned the historic meeting house that Alex and Ray can see from their porch. Vera and her husband Rodney were married in that building. They used to organize a harvest supper and feed 200 people. Vera exclaims, those ladies were a force of nature. She has been in and out of the hospital with cancer and has entered hospice. She is adamant about dying at home. She asks them if they could help her host a farewell party before the doctor helps her pass to the other side. Instead of a memorial service, I'd like a celebration send off, Vera says. How many funerals do you go to where you think, Jeepers, wouldn't the deceased would have liked this party and all these stories? I'd like to go to my own funeral. So the day comes. On the day of Vera's party, over 100 people walk up to the memorial grove. Vera arrives in an elegant green gown carried by her two adult sons in a large cushioned chair to the head of the meadow, where she presides over her own funeral with help from Ray. Ray wears a white dress and a colorful stole. She has made flower garlands for both she and Vera. Vera calls out to people, invites stories from friends, and chimes in with her own stories. She weeps openly as she talks about her life and her loved ones. She points across the field to the old Universalist meeting house, reminding everyone that she and Rodney were married there. One of the happiest days of my life, along with today. There is not a dry set of eyes in the field. Ray has put a booklet together of Vera's requested songs and hymns, and the group of Hidden River singers provide a foundation to the group sing. I will be resting here in this grove, Vera says, pointing to the oak trees at the end of the field, maybe over by that willow tree. Come visit here and talk to me. 
Vera weeps as her entire community and family sing Precious Lord, Take My Hand. Oh dear, Vera says, I'm blubbering away here, but I wonder if I could trouble you to sing that one more time. <laughs> of course, says Ray, it's your party. And the chorus begins again. You can join me. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. Vera says, it's my party and I'll cry if I want to. That has a whole new meaning here. A roar of laughter and a few sobs flow from the assemble. I love you all, says Vera, waving a handkerchief. Thank you for coming. Having you here, I am not afraid. I am not afraid of what comes next. A long reception line winds through the field as people linger and bid goodbye to Vera until she whispers to her sons that she is tired and ready to go home. Still, people linger long after Vera's chair is lifted up and paraded out of the field to a waiting van. Many remain in their seats, pleasantly stunned, taking in the experience. That was remarkable, says Tom Hayes, a retired farmer who's known Vera since they were children. That's how I want to go. Where do I sign up? <laughs> and let me end around the themes of violence and nonviolence, which, and Ray wrestles through her whole life, but you should understand, and I, she is an activist, uh, and she's part of the, the Clamshell Alliance. She's like a nonviolent direct action trainer. She trains people around the Pledge of Resistance to stop US intervention in, in, in Nicaragua. She's involved in fighting gas pipeline construction. She's, a, she's a dedicated to nonviolent action in the most creative sense. But as she, gets more kind of absorbed into the climate change debate, she, she starts to question this idea that we are all responsible for what's happening. She believes from her experience living in Central America that we in the North consume way more, we burn more carbon, we're responsible for excessive lifestyle. But she also really starts to dig into um, the, the, the knowledge around this. And, and so let me just read a little bit about Ray at the end of her life as she sort of comes to grips with what she's learning. She, um, there's a scene, let me set the stage. Any, any of you ever been to the book mill in Montague? Yeah. I recommend it. Its motto is books you don't need and a place you can't find. <laughs> One of their favorite places to go bike riding. There are not as many hills as around here in Wyndham County. You can go down on the Connecticut River and loop around. And so she and Ray love love this like um, uh, this particular bike ride. It's actually where they have their first kiss long many years ago. So they periodically go back to the same spot and have a little smooch and remember their first kiss. Thirty six. So this is thirty six years later, they're out on this bike ride and. Um, So after a pause for a smooch break at the waterfall, they continue past two farm stands offering late season asparagus. They park their e-bikes on a rack at the Montague Book Mill, the funky bookstore perched over the rocky waterfall, a former mill site. Reggie wanders the book stacks while Ray orders a plate of cold peanut noodles and an iced tea and sits at an outdoor table. The tumbling water provides a solid state background noise to her reading. She is on one of her relentless learning immersions, this time focused on the fossil fuel industry and its role in blocking solutions on climate change. Over the pandemic, she has video dates with several friends of Reggie's who are investigative journalists and documentary filmmakers. She has read the lawsuit briefs filed by citizens groups against oil and gas companies and governments for failing to protect the public. They are all 
They, they, detail, they all detail the tactics of the oil and gas industry in deflecting any limits to production. In the previous week, they've watched a documentary called The Power of Oil, and now she pulls out her Guardian Weekly with a special investigation on carbon bombs, which she's actively reading pen in hand. Reggie finally joins Ray. He sets three book purchases down and a glass of hard cider on the table. She starts right in. She says, basically, these oil companies are betting against humanity. She waves her fork in the air. They are incapable of stopping themselves. She points at what she's reading to Reggie. Look, you have the Secretary General of the United Nations saying that if we don't cut fossil fuel use, we will miss our chance to secure a livable and sustainable future. And you've got big oil and gas investing in 195 projects that will each release at least a billion tons of carbon emissions, what they call carbon bombs. Reggie knows this picture. But the data is stunning still. Wow, he says. Our job is to keep, to make sure those become stranded assets, that those carbon holdings remain in the ground, and all that infrastructure and equipment becomes useless. What a waste. Ray puts down her fork, putting her hands in her lap, and leaning toward Reggie so their foreheads are almost touching. Yeah, well, those carbon barons are betting that your effort will fail that they will succeed in buying off the global politicians long enough to extract, burn, and make a profit. I hope that pisses you off. She's saying this to her husband. She says, Ray, and you should know that Reggie works for this group called the Labor Network for Sustainability. He's, this is what he does, right? He says, Ray, that's my job to stay pissed. Reggie doesn't say anything more in response to her provocation. He's been watching with concern as she is more impatient and righteous and sometimes seems hurtful to the people she loves. Recently, she stood up at a local talk about beavers and criticized the analytical shortcomings of a young speaker. And she's been yelling on the phone and hanging up on her brother Toby and using the F word more and more frequently. Reggie focuses on Ray, watching her as well as listening. She's more agitated than passionate. She swear, he swears he sees a flicker of fear in her eyes, not her usual slow burning fire. Or is it a flavor of rage that she, he is unaccustomed to? You know, he thinks, you're with someone for 36 years, but still there's sometimes uncharted territory. Ray notices this look. They exchange a silent glance. She says, you think I've gone off the deep end. Reggie says, it, it just looks like your celebrated cold anger fission is hot and heading toward the meltdown zone. Yeah, you may be right about that. Ray pauses before making a confession. I feel something off kilter in my body, in my gut. And of course, as I mentioned before, she learns that she doesn't have long to live. And finally, I'm just going to end with this little excerpt, again, setting the scene. For those of you local, you'll appreciate this. But she tells, she tells Reggie she's, she's thinking about this. She's thinking about going out in an act of violence, an act of terror. And he is a savvy organizer. And he's like, that may be cathartic for you, but that is the dumbest, dumbest thing you could do. That means I'm going to end soon. <laughs> and he says, you know, look, could we, I know you don't want to, she's like, I'm not going to talk about it anymore. I'm not going to implicate you. I'm not going to tell you any more details. I'm going to leave you out of this. I don't, I'm going to protect you. He's like a little bit like, why, you know, I don't want you to protect me. But he says, how about this? The next day he says to her, how about this? What if we have an old fashioned Quaker clearness committee? Quakers have this great process for discernment to think about a question with some trusted elders and friends. So Ray says, I agree to that, and I want to have Alex, her young daughter person, and she invites her friend Kathy, who is her long-term kind of organizing comrade. Kathy comes out from Boston, 
And where do they go? Do they go to the top of Putney Mountain? Mm -hmm. They bring some folding chairs. And uh, Ray has a lot of ha happy memories from the hawk watches there. And they leave all their cell phones in the trunk of the, in the, in the car. In the tr in the, and they go out and they have it out. They sit for a couple of hours. And I'm not going to read the whole conversation. But it's a really a, a, a grappling with nonviolence and violence, tactics, strategy. And uh, so Reggie says, you know, Ray starts in and sort of describes her view that, look, I've been working on nonviolent as a nonviolence forever, but things have changed. In my mind, things have changed. Um, so I've come to the conclusion that these are extraordinary times that require extraordinary measures. She says, these fossil, these fossil, there are people I regard as evil who fully know the harms they are causing, yet can continue to do what they're doing. They are not just bystanders or accomplices, but perpetrators. And Reggie sort of takes this in and he says, look, I'm mad at them too. You know, I, I have rev anger and rage and murderous feelings. But my concern is more about the implications for the rest of us. After you've done your purging act of violence, I think it could set back the movement. Reggie, Ray takes in what Reggie's saying and she says, I'd like to hear more about that, but here's my view. For over 25 years, the movement to reverse climate crisis has been highly disciplined and nonviolent. For a long time, we acted as if we were the problem, all of us, with our lifestyle and excessive use of fossil fuels. Then the movement finally started to focus on the actual global energy companies, the fossil fuel giants that profit from the extraction and burning of carbon. As we know, these corporations deliberately unleashed the merchants of doubt. These individual carbon barons knew decades ago about the harms of greenhouse gases, and yet they did everything they could to sow uncertainty and block change, funding sham science, bankrolling climate deniers for political office. Later, when they couldn't deny the reality anymore, anymore they agreed to meaningless symbolic actions the, and pronouncements about sustainability, but they never slowed down from building new power plants, laying new pipelines, and planning to extract and burn more and more they have to be stopped. Her friend Kathy says, but it's not a few CEOs, Ray, says Kathy. The problem is a whole system with boards and shareholders and we, the public, clamoring for cheap energy. Yes and no, says Ray. There are specific men who've been working in this industry for decades. I've got my short list. They have had the information about the harms for decades. They could have made a very different decisions. They could have made very different decisions and they'd still be in the world's richest 0.1%. They deployed their considerable clout to block the flourishing of alternatives. They paid lobbyists to oppose higher energy efficiency standards. They limited the choices that we, the public had. And we chose, and they chose to expand carbon burning in the face of all the evidence. They took the money and ran. That is evil. That is willful, premeditated murder. And let me jump ahead. Everyone is silent. There's more dialogue, but I won't read aware that this is becoming an important space for Ray and Reggie to hash things out. There's a long pause. What about doing a Norman Morrison in the lobby of Shell or ExxonMobil? A sacrificial act, not a murder, says Reggie. Now, who is Norman Morrison? Norman Morrison is here on the altar. Along with Wynne Bruce and uh, Norman Morrison in 1965 was a Quaker from Baltimore who set himself on fire outside the Pentagon, uh, outside Robert McNamara's office. Many decades later in the fog of war, Robert McNamara says, that event haunted me my entire life. Norman Morrison, uh, 
there's a section in the book where Ray meeting the real Brian Wilson, not the beach boy Brian Wilson, but Brian Wilson who lived in Greenfield and lost his legs blocking a train, told the true story. One of the things, one of my motivations for writing this book is I wanted to lift up some of these stories about some real people, including Brian Wilson, because Brian Wilson was obsessed with Norman Morrison. When I went to visit Brian in his house, he had this picture on the wall. And the reason was they went to the same high school. Brian went off as a, Norman Morrison uh, did his action and then um, Brian knew about it. He was like, what a crazy guy. What an, he, he went off to be a soldier in Vietnam. And he's in Vietnam, this is true. And he is on, the, he's part of the ground unit following up an aerial attack in a village where supposedly these were Viet Cong sympathizers. So he goes into the village to see what, what's, what's here. And there are casualties, they're all old people and children. There are no young people. And he goes and he sees a hut and he enters the hut and there is an altar and the candles are still burning. And on the altar is a picture of Norman Morrison. And Brian can, this is, he can't, he can't get this out of his head. That becomes his, so Norman Morrison, the story of Norman Morrison is in this book. So in that moment, when Reggie says, what about a Norman Morrison? Reggie, Ray knows exactly what he's talking about. He says, what about a Norman Morrison in the lobby of Shell or ExxonMobil? A sacrificial act, not a murder, says Reggie. That's the old nonviolent credo, says Ray. Draw suffering upon oneself. Gandhi, MLK, I get that. I've lived that my entire life. I've thought about that. But I think we're past that point. We're talking about a couple dozen powerful people who've wrecked the planet because of their own greed. And they have actively, they're actively doing more damage now, and they are actively blocking the efforts of the rest of humanity to avert disaster as we sit here. They're betting we won't get our act together in time to stop them. They are hoping we're gonna go to a lot of climate grief workshops and sit around crying about our lost futures. Boo hoo for our grandchildren. The oil barons are building their bunkers and private jet landing strips. Well, fuck them. Is our society just going to stand by and let them destroy the earth? The three others pause again, taking in the intensity of Ray's convictions. Ray's hands are shaking in fury. Bring more suffering upon ourselves? I know that theory of nonviolence, and there are plenty of scenarios where I would agree with it morally and tactically. But let's say we live in a neighborhood, and every week some arsonist shows up and burns down another neighbor's house. Should we all sit around and sing dirges and pass the Kleenex? Boo-hoo, there goes another house. How can we nonviolently stop the arsonist, appeal to their fucking humanity? The asshole is burning down our neighborhood. Are we just going to sit there and take it? Should we set ourselves on fire? Now, what if the arsonist controls the whole system? That they can turn off the fire hydrants? That they can even deny that they're fires? And they'll block all of our nonviolent efforts? Well, guess what? That's where we're at. So let me, let me close by saying, Alex, at her memorial service, says, what Ray did was wrong. But what Ray would say is, if you don't like what I did, what will you do? What bold action will you take to defend Mother Earth, our one and only home? What are you called to do? Thank you. Thank you. So there's a microphone there. If people want to come and ask a question or bring something up, you can go use the microphone. And, and we will assure that everyone's voice is heard.
Yeah, for the listeners at home. <laughs> Please use the microphone. Yeah, so feel free to come down. Doesn't have to be a question. It could be a comment, reaction, reflection, what's on your mind. Um, yeah, would you mind? Do you... Sure, where is it? Oh, it's right here, yeah. Come on over. Come on down. Uh, thanks so much for that. Um, have you read a book called American War by Omar el Akkad? Because elements of his story remind me of elements of your story, but it, the, you know they come about it in such a different way, You know this path to violence. Um, and I'm just wondering if you know it. I, I don't, I've heard of it and I haven't read it, but... Uh, yeah, it's about the my... Second American Civil War, uh, 2075 to 2096. Oh, okay, and it's so fought... it's future fiction. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And it's fought on the basis of, um, you know, the states that wish that outlawed fossil fuel usage and uh, the states that, you know, rebelliously stuck with it. And all right, there's another, yeah, it's, another it's really in the genre. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cool. That was it. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll ask you <clears throat> um, so I was struck by the relationship between Alex, who's raised sort of daughter because she doesn't have children of her own, um, and the whole the whole scene where Ray has her miscarriage, and it's. It's the same day she learns that the Jesuits were murdered in El Salvador, um, and she doesn't know how to channel her fury. Um, and sometimes with activists, their anger is coming from a different place than just the social issue that they are focused on. I've noticed that in my life. So I, I wanted you to comment on whether there was maybe more to raise fury than just climate change. And secondly, regarding the relationship with Alex, would you agree that there's maybe a metaphor there for Alex as the younger generation paying the price for the actions of the elders? Yeah, um, without revealing too much, because we hope you read the story, uh, Alex um, helps, Alex drives Ray to the end, to her um, destiny event, but then is the one who is punished for it. She's, because Ray's gone, people are looking for somebody to punish, and her daughter, who is not really part of the plot, just gave her the ride, is, serves jail time. So yes, there's a, there's a way in which, uh, you know, uh, how do the sins of our parents are visited upon the, the next generation element to it. Um, but yeah, I, I would say, you know, I mean, there, Ray is 99% motivated by love. She is a, that's, you know, you, hopefully that comes through that she, uh, but she's been shaped and formed by some experiences like her time in Central America. So there's a section of the book called accompaniment, which is really just about, it's a brief part of her life, just six months, but it's very influential on her where she is with, chil she's helping children mostly. She's in an orphanage, she's in a refugee camp. She has this experience of uh, minding, you know, seeing these children, developing a love and connection to them. And in a sense, she says, I'm responsible, I'm accountable to them. Um, and at a certain point she says, maybe I'm not gonna be a parent, maybe I'm gonna do this work on behalf of all these children that I cannot forget. They're in my heart and they're in my head. Um, and, it, and in the end, it isn't just about climate change. I think one of the things that kind of shapes her, affects her, is that sense that she's been exposed to the toxins. You know, it's the same corporations that she sort of feels like are poisoning the well uh, with their toxic chemicals or whatever. And that's, she's personally sick because of that. So there's, there's a lot, you know, I wouldn't say she becomes unhinged, but that, that section I read shows her evolving state of mind as she gets older, faces her, her mortality, and starts to be thinking, who, 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 who's responsible for this? So, yeah. 
Yeah. Hey, Joe. Hey, you want to? Um, I was wondering, it's very mysterious. Um, did Norman Morrison ever find out why Brian Wilson had an altar in Vietnam in the jungle? So Norman Morrison, you know, uh, died in 1965. And Brian discovered this altar uh, a couple years later. But what's interesting is, and again, this is true little history that I include in the story, Brian goes to visit Norman Morrison's mother uh, a year after he comes back from Vietnam. Turns out they both go to Chautauqua High School in, in New York. Ray, uh, uh, the, um, Brian Wilson remembers Norman Morrison. He was like an Eagle Scout. He was really this person he looked up to. And so he was able to go, he just showed up at Norman Morrison's mother's house and said, um, I got to tell you these experiences. Not only did about the altar and Norman Morrison being on the altar, but the North Vietnamese put Norman Morrison on a postage stamp. And, and Vietnam's most famous poet at the time wrote a poem about an ode to Norman Morrison. And Brian was having, at a dinner party and somebody sang a song about Norman Morrison. So everywhere he went, he was, so he was able to go and tell Norman Morrison's mo mother these stories the, the, about the impact her son had. Yeah, hi, Terry. Hi. Um, I, I'm a little confused. Did Norman Morrison went in front of Mac, McNamara's office, and did you say he lit himself on fire? Yes, he, he, he self-emulated. He lit himself on fire. He, he, he was killed. And, and the, the reason the other character was inspired by him is because he was in Vietnam and went into a hut and there was a shrine for him. Now, I, I'm curious, were the monks that would set themselves on fire inspired by him or was he inspired by them? He, he, was, uh, in, he was moved by the monks in okay. Vietnam who were emulating themselves yeah. around the Vietnam War okay. and said, as an American, I'm going to do what they did. Oh, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, and, and, you know, one of the things that, uh, well, I, I think we're, we're going to see an escalation of tactics around climate change. We already see people throwing soup at paintings, right? You know, or blocking streets. European, the French are now much more militant. And because the political system is captured and incapable of responding. So we're kind of, we're gonna see this. And, um, you know, it wasn't that well known, but uh, Wynn Bruce, who's here on, uh, around the Supreme Court decision that had uh, implications for climate change, uh, also took his own life a year ago, April, uh, in front of the Supreme Court. So it's not that well known, but I think it's not, I think we're, I would not be surprised to see more witness more bold and, and uh, in some ways, um, a reflection of powerlessness, that we don't feel like our political system is capable of, of responding. And so we're, we're, in a, we're in a collision course between this crisis and the failure of our democracy to respond. Um, I have, have not read your book, but I did read uh, A. Landenberger's uh, front page articles today. Um, and she mentioned in it uh, some elements uh, of um, uh, Dorothy Day and Berrigan's and Catholic activism and stuff, and, and you talked some about Quakerism and stuff. So is there a question, if, if you take, you know, what, what role does uh, religion sort of have in the book? I mean, if you took a people's uh, uh, attachment to their religions or, or their feelings or their, their connections to their religions out, would it be a different book or, or, or it, yeah. yeah um, so Ray and Reggie both have Catholic roots, but then they are very they become connected to Quakers and other people of faith who are active in these social movements. Um, and in a sense, I, while I, I was you know not wanting to most people are kind of turned off by organized religion, but I, 
but I set out to write a book about formation. In the, in the, in the Christian tradition, formation is how do you align your life with the teachings of Jesus mm -hmm. um, and discipleship. And uh, I didn't mention this, but you know, one of the, one of the uh, Ray reads Diedrich Bonhoeffer's book, Discipleship. She is becomes, she believes it's a Bonhoeffer moment in relation to the climate change. And in fact, the book starts, her action happens on Easter morning a month ago, April 9th, 2023, which was the 78th anniversary of the execution of Diedrich Bonhoeffer. So Ray is like, she's like one of those people who has like a liturgical and everything calendar in her head. She like is paying attention to anniversaries all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll, I'll let, um, I'll let Reggie answer your question, though, about the influence of religion at, at, at this event seven years after her, uh, you know, her, it's really her birthday. They, they don't celebrate the day that, of the bombing. They celebrate her birthday. Um, a lot of people ask the question you ask about Ray and Ray's life. Um, let me just see if I can find this. Okay, here we go. People ask me, this is Ray, Reggie in his eulogy. People ask me, was, Reggie, was Ray a Christian? Was she religious? Like me, she was raised in the Catholic Church, steeped in the traditions and teachings of Jesus. But let me be clear, and I mean no offense by this, Ray was more Christian than the Christians. She lived a life that followed the teachings of Jesus better than anyone I know who was affiliated with the institutional church, including priests and bishops, respect for life, radical simplicity, preferential option for the poor, radical hospitality, love across borders, queer liberation, non-cooperation with injustice. And, and um, she says, uh, and then he says something about it. So she, and, and, and he says, you know, she believed that religious, religious life would look like this community that they've built at Hidden River Farm. Um, she believed that the Hidden River Farm is what discipleship would look like today. She thought modern religious orders would, look, would be like this community with a vow of simplicity and a commitment to hospitality of welcoming the stranger. These were religious tenets, the intention to live in harmony with the earth, humble and in alignment with Gaia, listening for her messages, observing her wisdom ways, love and care for another and all living creatures and building a beloved community. She acted out of reverence for life, not from a place of hatred. At the end, Ray was a Bonhoeffer Christian. Killing to stop the greater evil becomes the righteous thing to do. You may be offended by the killing, by the loss of innocent family members, or you may have supported Ray's actions. But in the end, this is what Ray uh, meant, took to believe the Oscar Romero quote, let your life speak through you. So yeah, this is, a, this is really about what forms us. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure how, you know, how she would have been formed without those religious traditions. Mm -hmm. It's very much a part of her, who she is. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Spoon, hi. A most fascinating uh, topic. Um, I read uh, years ago when I was exploring anarchism, of course, I came across Alexander B Berkman and, and thought uh, uh, long and hard over the years because it's, my life has always bounced around in one place or another that was either concerned with nonviolence or, or more interested in understanding revolution and social change and human suffering and all of that. Um, I thought your book might have been a little bit more interesting if the person was not an elderly person on the verge of death, but a younger person that had everything to live for and knew that their action would result in their own death. 
And that, of course, changes the whole complexion of what, because revolutions are fought basically by the young who, who, who are fighting for their lives, their futures. And um, so I, I'm very thankful. I'm, I'm pleased, and I want to thank you anyway for introducing this, this uh, idea. That, and, it, and it helps us understand that how we can be living in these times that you describe on the verge of almost self-annihilation, and we see so little agitation, mm. so little resistance. And it's only because the audience, most of the audience we speak to here, feels like they have too much to lose. Mm. Families, youth, property, houses, the good life, very hard to be, very hard to sacrifice mm. under those circumstances. Yeah. Um, but the times are c coming when uh, when people will be making Earth first is what I think of, and yeah. um, and will I hope to see more of that. I I have met uh, Ryan Wilson and uh, many people who who have c confronted the powers that be, and, and it takes a lot of courage. Yeah. Thanks. Um, just, just um, <clears throat> I think one of the things that Ray talks about is uh, kind of in the spirit of, um, you know, this new organization, Third Act, the idea that, uh, in, in, I know in Mexican culture, they talk about the tercera edad, your last third, the last third of life. In this case, Third Act is really, you know, people over 60 engaged in taking greater risks for climate justice. And the whole idea is we're in a better position for the reasons you said, mentioned, Spoon, to, to take risks. Uh, we, have, you know, we don't have our whole lives in front of us. We don't have, you know, we, we haven't, we've had children if we're, or not, but we're, we're past child raising, you're, you're, you know. We're, uh, so um, I like to say, Ray started the last act group, you know, and actually in the story, in the in the in the seven years after, there are a lot of copycat actions. There are there are a variety of other bold actions that are taken, not not assassination, et cetera, but like along the Norman Morrison or militant actions. So, um, but I actually think for those of us who've in the in the global north in the last third of our lives who have economic stability, we've been the huge, the biggest beneficiaries of the fossil fuel era. So while we're maybe not as responsible as the leaders of the fossil fuel industry, we still have had enormous privilege and advantage because of 70, 80, a th century of building upon the, the fossil fuel legacy. So uh, we have a disproportionate responsibility, I guess, to engage. That's so I think that's she's thinking at the end of her life. And one of the things that it triggers is there's a group of uh, grandmothers that call themselves the good ancestors who, who are kind of like who undertake a militant direct action. Um, so I think well, younger people can figure out how they want to respond to it. But Ray would say the oldsters need to do our part, big, big part. So, yeah. Hey. Michael. One of the inspirations of the fiction is the real life higher ground, you know, uh, community burial ground. Yeah. So much gratitude, Chuck. Thank you for all that you are and what you are offering and what you are inviting us to engage with as we absorb and explore our own responsibilities and our own motivations. And it's really about motivations that I'd like to um, muse on. I have no idea what's about to come out, but I'll start. <laughs> um, you talk about cold anger as being this simmering thing with Ray and what drives her. Not having read the book or even and he's <laughs> writing about it earlier. 
I'm curious about how you have conceived her own sense of self-acceptance, her own ability to kind of work through issues of her own identity, such that love ultimately becomes a growing emergent force in her life. Because for me, having been through different kinds of organizing and community development initiatives and things about good, the people who burn out are not the ones who are the most passionate. They're the ones who don't have some kind of inner core from which they're working. And if that can really be the source of movement into whatever their action is, then that's what's durable, that's what inspires, that what's, mm. it's the energy that ripples out. So how were you thinking about that with Ray? Well, um, maybe this is, I don't know if we should wrap up, but I think that one of the things that, um, that Ray uh, looks to altars for, the reason she's, is the, she's in this refugee camp, she meets a woman who's a midwife named Chepa, and Chepa uh, has delivered half the babies in San Vicente province, and now she's in this refugee camp with 4,000 people, and there's probably a couple babies a day being born, and so she's, she's busy. The midwife, Chepa, is busy, but she invites Ray to her little cubicle where she has an altar, and on the altar are her son and her husband, who've both been killed in the conflict, and Ray, Ray is like, wow, I think, you know, she can't believe, and, and Chepa says, the altar is my source. It is my, she doesn't really finish the thought. It's just, but Ray gets it. It's like, yeah, this is how she keeps pulling toward life, toward becoming, you know, to bringing babies a new life into the world. Um, and that when she leaves her mission in, Central America, she's sort of like, the one thing that she takes away is, you know, if things go bad, I can always build an altar and draw strength from that. Um, so I would say it comes back to all the things that formed her, all the, all the people that were on her altar, you know? So Wally, Juanita Nelson, war tax resistors in Deerfield, um, Oscar Romero, you know, who and she studied and was influenced by, and, and some of the others here, these were, you know, she really took her connection to ancestors and the people that came before her very seriously, and that was a strength that, that grounded her and fortified her in whatever she did. So, um, and she would, she, she offered that to others. She built community altars, but she also had, you know, a private altar in her own dresser for where, where maybe she was in active grief and facing something but she invited other people into that practice. So, um, so yeah, that, that's what helped her keep pulling toward life over and over and over again. So. so the element of heart was really at the core, and from there she was just longing for the right expression, sounds like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Should we, should we wrap up, Liz? I think I've, you all have been think, sitting so thoughtfully, thank you. Sure. Um, I, I was going to say I have uh, there's a I have a website called ChuckCollinsWrites.com where there's like a there's like more background links to some of the things. That, so if you read the book, it, check out that website. There's like a discussion guide. There's photos of some of these places. Oh yeah, Annie. The other thing I loved was at the very end. Ray's reading list. Right. That, that's really worth its weight in gold. Yeah. It's really a good thing to have included. She's a bookworm, you know. So, uh, and if you haven't read Annie's uh, article in the Commons, it gave me goosebumps reading it. So I was like, okay, well, she, she's, she's uh, picking up something here and sharing it back. So thank you for that. Yeah, Odelia. Yeah. Um, sorry, I don't know exactly what I'm going to say, but. I just wanted to... You can stay right where you are. Okay, thank yeah. you. I just wanted to say thank you so much. And um, thanks. Um, I, I really, really appreciate your life's witness and your testimony. Um, and um, I... Sort of an altar to my partner uh, who just passed on Earth, the dawn of Earth Day. Um, 
every dollar we spend, and your life is living testimony to this, Chuck. You and I both gave away our access to wealth because of our nonviolent convictions when we were young. And every dollar we spend, regardless of what it's spent on, is multiplied threefold under the multiplier effect in economics, generating three times the amount of economic activity that's killing the planet. Every dollar, regardless of what it's spent on. And I thank you for your witness. I thank you for the questions you raise and for our humble attempts to so imperfectly live simply so others may simply live. Amen, yeah. Nilly and I have known each other, and she, a lot of the people on this altar are, we, sh we share some of those elders. Uh, she's holding Chuck, the picture of Chuck Mathai, who is very important, but, but uh, Nilly, she met the Nelsons when she was five years old. <laughs> so. Polaris Action, the first yeah. nuclear submarine protest in the world. Yeah. I don't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> Rumor has it, yeah. <laughs> I told by my elders. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else you want to say?